Right, let's morning. start. Morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. 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 Hello, Yala. Morning. All right. Good morning. Welcome from all over the country. I trust you are all fine to mild to excellent. Oh, guys, please one. mute your microphones while the speaker is talking. Okay. I'm Raina Ritter, ISDSI board member and Western Cape chair, and will be the host for this session. I believe you have either a hat or lipstick on, if that is if you've read the last um, invitation that we've sent. So it's now the time to hit the show myself and unmute button for one minute. So we can just see everybody's faces. Let's go. Hello, Laura. <laughs> there you go. Wonderful. Look at all the faces. We long time no see. Where's everybody? Charlene, Milani, Michael, Anthea. <laughs> Where's the lipstick? Where's the hats? There we go. Wonderful. I don't, I don't think Elsie owns a hat, you see. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the glasses will do. Hey. Okay. Ah, there, ah, there, ah, there. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, everybody. Right. For those that had birthdays between February and August, I hope it was an absolutely wonderful day um, with your friends and with your family. Blessings for the next 12 months to come. Um, and then also for those who lost friends, family, loved ones, our sincere condolences. Um, you are definitely in our thoughts. This COVID is not a thing to play with. Right, let's get into it. Um, if all can mute themselves and put off the cameras again, I'm going to share a screen. Right, I would like to inform all that there's a lot of work and time and effort going into paper scripts reviews, updating of all policies and procedures, et cetera, all taking place in the background. So it's not that ASDSA absolutely do nothing. I would like to thank those involved. I'm just gonna run quickly through it. ASDSA engagements respond to the following, the National School of Government call for public consultation, national implementation framework towards the professionalization of the public service. Then there's a couple of things that we have done with SACWA. Um, We've reported the fake certificate website to them, the awaiting information. Then the designation descriptions on the NRLD are updated. The ARPL policy suggestions, amendments, and then the CPD procedure policy CPD record card that we've updated. Then in September month, we have to attend the DH engagement on research forum, the second RPL QST working group, National Skills Conference, we don't have yet the RSVP or a link for that meeting. And then the Department of Labor countrywide is going to do the employment equity workshops. We know the dates, but we don't know the link as yet. So we'll keep you posted on that one also. Then we say welcome to Angela Schultz. She's the new person, the new chairperson for Gauteng Region who accepted her role during July. She's, she's very new but um, she will get to it. We'll help her with that. Then other information to share. We are varying in various interesting conversation sessions, which is only for members, unfortunately. Monthly Exco regional chair meetings are definitely taking place. We had one yesterday. We are busy with introducing the monthly debit order facility for membership and designations. So we will keep you posted on that one. We are busy reviewing and updating various ASDSA policies and procedures. Then we also sent, well, the services CETA and bank center challenges have been addressed with a particular CETA and we've also sent it through to the Department of Higher Education. Um, and then the STF WSP ATR survey that was sent yesterday. This is a very important, important statistical survey and we would like to get a better understanding of just how large the impact is as well as feedback on the working relationship between the CETAs and the STFs. 
to manage the funds flowing from this SDL. We will also be doing the discretionary grants one later in the year. These findings will be shared with the IGT, so please send it through to your, your um, list of STFs or internal or external. That is very, very important that you get that information. Then future events that we're going to do workshops on is gaining and maintaining a designation, the CPD workshop, and then an RPL workshop to assist you. Then just quickly to get through to the WhatsApp group for the members, um, I would like to encourage you to add your questions to the WhatsApp member group. We are members have, well, the members that we've got has got years experience between themselves. I would assume that if somebody answered to answer to all, instead of sending individual emails to those asking for the answer to, although it's up to a particular person to share all info or only a portion they are. Time is money and nobody works for free. People often forget if I do a job in 30 minutes, it's because I spent 10 or 20 years learning how to do that in 30 minutes. You owe me for the years, not the minutes. So it might be that we're not gonna give you all the information then, you know, there's still the, the, the money um, aspect of it. Right, then one of the rules of the WhatsApp group is that you do please display your name and your surname. Sometimes we did, somebody's asking a question. We don't know how, you know, who it is. What is the name, the surname? Where are you from? Um, so please, that is one of the rules. If you read the rules of the WhatsApp group, you display your name and the surname. It's no good you've got a little line or a heart or whatever. We don't know who we're talking to. All right. Then current designations at the moment, we've got 297 members and obviously it's growing. Then the master de designation, we've got 14 people currently, practitioners 29 and technicians 12. And that is also growing. I've put the percentages next to it. Then lastly, well, second, lastly, ISDSA needs to appoint three new board members. We will share the requirements and criteria now during September, but you can start to think of yourself or others to nominate in the meantime. All right. And the last thing is our AGM is on the 13th of October. So please save the date. We will communicate the information to you. I'm going to hand over to Doc Flores Brunsloor. ISDSA Chair of the Garden Youth to present a topic called a Holistic QA Approach to Implementation of the OQSF. My suggestion is to have a question and answer session afterwards, let's say the last 15 minutes, we've got time until 10 o'clock. Um, but please feel free to put your questions in the chat box during the presentation. I will read them after the presentation in order for Flores to respond. If there's not enough time, we can then ask Flores to respond later and distribute that questions and answers to the attendees. I also want to take the opportunity to thank Flores for presenting. He's doing an enormous amount of work we can't imagine. I always said we need to clone him. Flores, that is over to you. Just want to share your screen quickly. Thank you, Marina, and uh, good morning, everybody. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Uh, I I'm a member of uh, two professional bodies in South Africa, and uh, I um, often think of the ASDSA as my preferred professional body, although if I say that too loudly, then the other guys get a bit missed. But uh, anyway, uh, I really am absolutely uh, enthralled with the amount of work that the ASDSA is doing. Uh, just looking at that list of various activities that Marini shared with us, that's great stuff. Uh, that engagement process is particularly with SACWA and of course at national government is so critical, especially when you hear in the media about some of the rather unfortunate happenings that are going on in, uh, around the Department of Higher Education and Training at the moment. So colleagues, my topic today, as uh, Marina has indicated, is it's about a holistic approach to the occupational qualification sub-framework. And <clears throat> of course the, uh, the main person or main organization that has the responsibility for this is the Quality Council for Trades and Occupations. This is an organization that um, is, I believe, getting uh, a little bit better every day. Uh, it is growing, I think, in size. Um, I, part of that survey that uh, Marina referred to uh, that went out yesterday 
Uh, one of the questions is, uh, should we increase uh, the funding to PCO? Uh, currently, they get 0.5% of the levy. And uh, the, the, one of the questions is, you know, to what, what, to what percentage level should that go up? So it's very important for us to give input to that um, because the grant regulations that include that allocation to the PCO are soon uh, to be uh, discussed as we go forward now. And of course, the whole COVID environment will significantly affect those grant regulations. <clears throat> so this topic of mine, just as an introduction, the first slide there, um, we work in a very, very big system. Uh, of course, the main document um, is the National Skills Development Plan 2030. Uh, I'm sure that as ASDSA members, all of us know that document very well. I'm sure that you read it every night before you go to bed. It's very important for us to understand it, but it must work within the big picture. The, the National Skills Development Plan works within the larger picture of the white paper for post-school education and training and that uh, national plan. That national plan has still not really been issued. I know that uh, many people have put copies of floats around, but it's not formally been issued yet. But that's the big system. Uh, I recently did a really uh, a nice piece of work together with some wonderful colleagues from Business Unity South Africa around the system, uh, particularly with a view to informing the, the business position around uh, the whole new system. And uh, we discovered in that work that South Africa doesn't skimp on funding on education and training. Uh, there's a huge amount of money in the system. It's estimated that uh, it's 8% of GDP, uh, which is a large number, 4,9 to one billion. It is in fact one of the largest uh, education and training systems in the world. <clears throat> and uh, on average, almost double what most other countries spend on education and training. Uh, the World Bank indicates on average countries spend 4.5% of their GDP on education and training. We actually double. The question that we have to ask though is, you know, are we really getting a good return on investment for that amount of money? Most people would say no. And so we as the ASDSA members, all of us have the, the opportunity and in fact the, uh, the duty to make sure that we improve the system as best we can. And uh, I think ASDSA's role in continuing lobbying government, pointing out the areas, trying to streamline, help them is absolutely critical. <clears throat> so colleagues, that uh, gives you a broad sort of a, a background as to, as to where we are situated. Uh, I do want to spend a few more minutes on this broader system. Uh, I think it's very critical for all of us to really understand this broad system. And so, Marena, if you just go to the next slide. Thank you. So, colleagues, there is a uh, graphic of our entire system. Um, we refer to this as the PSET, post-school education and training functionality. This is how the system is supposed to function. Um, this is, as far as I understand, the current scenario. Uh, nothing here has changed at the moment. You know, legislation and policies do come out from time to time. Uh, one, of the, one of the pieces of not really legislation, but I think it's a policy that may affect this quite significantly, is the uh, skills strategy that has been developed and is now being rolled out by the Department of Higher Education and Training in response to the National Economic Recovery and Reconstruction Plan. I know that the DDG for Skills Development, Mr. Mbalo in the DHET, uh, he's been presenting this yesterday at the Human Resource Development Council. Uh, he is also presented it at the Portfolio Committee. Uh, we have the pleasure of presenting it to us here in the Garden Route on Friday uh, as part of our forum that we run for skills development. And that document, I sense, may have a significant effect on the flow of funding around the system. But just to look at that graphic, uh, colleagues, we as uh, people, practitioners, technicians, masters, that ever work in this system, need to understand that we have this very complicated system, which uh, basically receives people from the schooling system, the DBE on the left, 
there's an average of around 14 to uh, 15 million youngsters in that system. And many of those systems come out of that schooling system, not necessarily with a grade 12 or a matric. We know that at least 50% of them don't make it, but they come into this post-schooling system. That blue line between schooling and post-schooling, we often sort of equate to around the age of 19 to 20. When you're after 20 years of age, you are in the schooling system, sorry, the post-schooling system, irrespective of what you manage to get in the schooling system. And of course, much of what comes out of the schooling system is not on standard uh, to be able to go into actual education and training institutions. You can't get uh, into universities, you can't get into technical colleges, and so many uh, folks have to go into community colleges. And, and <clears throat> then, of course, the sad part is many of them just don't get into those education and training institutions, and they land up in the needs funnel. And that lands up in that little red box at the bottom. And NEETS is a, a expression that was uh, created in Europe quite a few years ago. And it effectively stands for not in education, employment, or training. So if you are not in education, employment, or training, you're effectively nowhere. You, you are sitting on the home, sitting on the street, uh, and the, in, the sad news is that uh, the last uh, Labour Force survey indicated that if we are now pretty close to 8 million people in that needs box. And even when people go into education and training institutions, they could go to a college, they could go to a private skills development provider, they can go to an in-house skills development provider like a Ned Bank or, or, or a Checkers or any of those large institutional in-house in ones. And they can still come out of there and still not get either employment or self-employment. And so they, again, go down the needs funnel into that box. The COVID, of course, has also driven many people down that needs funnel, now um, <clears throat> sitting in that box. And the age of people sitting in the needs box has actually risen quite dramatically uh, with, the, uh, with the arrival of the COVID pandemic. Uh, most needs uh, we're in the ages of 18 to 24, maybe 18 to 36. But some of the statistics coming out of Stats SA now, the labor force surveys, are indicating that there are more older people now also in that needs box. So it's quite tragic, uh, and it needs uh, a huge amount of work. And then on the right-hand side of that graphic is, is where all the money sits, the incentive structures, the Department of Labor, sorry, Department of Employment and Labor, Dell, UIF, they do a lot of funding still, particularly in community education, at the Department of Trade and Industry and Competition with their BEE, and then of course SARS with the school development levy that goes out from employers, and then SARS offers incentives like Section 12H, and then the ETI, uh, not at the moment directly linked to skills, but uh, we're hoping in the future ETI will, link, will be linked a bit more to skills. And then there's the whole uh, 20, 80 percent discretionary grants, the 0.5 percent QCTO, and then the 20 percent down to the National Skills Fund. Uh, and the National Skills Fund is referred to as a catalytic fund. And uh, the National Skills Fund is more and more being focused on helping needs uh, into that system. That's the system as we have it. Uh, and um, all of us as ASDSA members. I need to know that in the standard system, but keep on asking ourselves, how can I improve the system? What can I do within the system to get it better, to get it simpler, and so on? Um, there is a, a very loud voice, particularly from business, that says that our system must get simpler. Of course, what I'm showing you, ladies and gentlemen, is, is really an overview, because within the system, you have all sorts of uh, little rules and regulations so on. There's the accreditation issues, there's the workplace approval issues, there's the actual grant regulation issues themselves, there's the program agreement regulations, all the different kinds of work based programs. So we do uh, really complicate lives for ourselves. However, the, the biggest weakness in the system that is acknowledged by quite a lot of people <clears throat> is that we are still mostly. Uh, using what we call a supply 
driven system where the uh, training and education institutions largely decide uh, what the young people or even older people need to learn and then they develop these programs and courses they market them people then sign up uh, you know based on what they think they like and uh, then they go for training they come out they have certificates and unfortunately in many many cases it's not what the industry wants not what employers really want and so you have this ongoing cry from industry uh, about the skills gap and so on now the way that the uh, more developed countries in the world have have fixed this and i speak particularly of the gold standard such as in switzerland the way that they fix it in Marina, if you can just click once to to take me just one There we go, thank you. Uh, it's to move the uh, influence of employers uh, to the front of the system. And that is now what we are trying very hard to do in South Africa. So we move it more to a demand-based sort of system where employers particularly are more involved in informing uh, what must go into the curriculum, into the programs, the types of programs, and so on. This is not a new concept, been around for many years. We just really are struggling to get it right in, in South Africa. And so hopefully this new holistic approach to the occupational qualification sub-framework, which is being driven by the QCTO, will, to a large degree, start to also drive us in that direction. And so if I go to the next slide, uh, please, Morena. Uh, I'm going to ask Morena to slowly build the slide. This is the slide that builds up as we go, ladies and gentlemen. But I just want to spend uh, the first few minutes on uh, this uh, seven steps, as we call them. Uh, some of you who have been around in the system for many years, you may recall uh, that we had seven steps to becoming an artisan, which is something we developed in. 2010, uh, when we started to operationalize the National Artisan Moderation Body, when I started to work there at Itlela at Wollefonsfontein, uh, we developed a, a model called the Seven Steps to Becoming an Artisan. Those seven steps after two years were amended and adjusted because we felt that there was something not quite right with the original seven steps. And so through stakeholder processes, we got it right. And so we do have a, a seven steps to becoming an artisan that is still used largely in, in South Africa. That work that we did informed this work. And this work is the work that is now in process uh, at QCTO. This is a huge project within QCTO, and it is a holistic approach to the occupational qualification sub-framework. Just to remind all of us, the occupational qualification sub-framework includes all occupational qualifications from NQF level one all the way up to NQF level eight. And so our higher education institutions, whether they are private or public, can certainly participate on occupational qualifications. It's not only for uh, the colleges or people that work within the TVET space. In fact, uh, <clears throat> I think that uh, the whole Tibet space itself, broadly speaking, when you look at some of the developments in other parts of the world, especially with digital 4IR and all the new skills, future skills that are developing, uh, we are moving further up the NQF in terms of the complexity and the level of competency we need in Tibet. Tibet is definitely creeping up into level five as well as level six of the uh, NQF. There's absolutely no doubt in my mind. And so colleagues, this broadly is the holistic approach to every single occupational qualification. Uh, I just wanna mention one or two small um, adjustments here that we must be aware of as we go forward in our work. And I will share with you what I believe my own view of where ASDSA members, uh, whether you are an individual, a consultant, or whether you're part of a company, uh, where we can help and support, and of course, also maybe generate some income for ourselves in each one of these areas. The qualifications and program development step one 
I just want to stress, colleagues, that we are working extremely hard here to get a complete package that is under step one. Uh, at the moment, the uh, occupational qualifications uh, are just literally a qualification, a curriculum framework, and an assessment specification. Uh, there's no learning materials attached to it. Uh, there are really uh, no actual rollout, what we call a national occupational curriculum content. Uh, you know, what we, the old days, we used to call it the detailed syllabus. Uh, those things are left largely to uh, other organizations, whether it's national departments, whether it's public colleges, whether it's private providers. Uh, and, and we just think that there needs to be uh, at least some minimum sort of guidelines and standards to make it more efficient and more effective. And so it's a qualification and program development step. It's combined. And you will understand that if we have employers involved, business, particularly subject matter experts who are involved in that step, then uh, it will certainly uh, get better. Uh, I'll show you the linkages just now um, to uh, step seven. Step one and step seven are critically, critically important to link because at the end of this whole learning process, you must be employed or self employed. Otherwise, you, you know, you've wasted your time. And so what you put into that design of the qualification and program in step one must be informed big time by step seven. Is it working at the end? If you sign up for an electrical qualification, do you at the end of the process, after you've qualified, you've got your certificate, can you do the job? Are your clients happy that you are competent? Or have you wasted your time? Are you, you have to now go and do something else because what you learned, you really didn't crack it. That's very critical. Uh, step two, uh, which is accreditation and workplace approval. Uh, colleagues, you've noticed we have combined these two, the QCTO and the occupational qualification sub framework approach is that you can't really get accreditation as a provider without some linkage to employers. Uh, this is not uh, a surprise to many of the private sector individuals. Uh, in fact, I think all uh, skills development providers in the private sector have always had some relationship with a workplace. And so there are many of our private sector people, they do this almost automatically when they take learners in, they are already starting to link those learners with the employers. I think it is a strength in our system in the private sector. However, the difficulty and, and where the great weakness is in the public sector. Our public sector, particularly the TVET colleges and more so the community colleges, their relationships with the employers are not that strong. It is getting better, uh, even in my own uh, local college here, the Southgate College in Garden Route, and I'm, I'm privileged to serve as a counselor on that college. Uh, it is getting better, slowly but surely, we are starting to bring more and more employers on board. And so accreditation and workplace approval go together. And that's why they are absolutely uh, in step two. And then in step three, colleagues, uh, career guidance and management, critical. Uh, all of us will know there are so many young people that start a program for absolutely the wrong reason. Mainly the reason is because they want to stipend and not because they're particularly interested in what they are learning. And so uh, the focus of uh, the two, three, four years, whatever they're learning, it's all about just surviving, getting money, and learning is almost incidental to so many young people. And so this is something that we really have to try to fix. Of course, if all learning and development was completely free in South Africa, uh, then that would disappear because then people are not dependent on stipends and so on to, to be able to uh, actually learn. Uh, if you think about yourselves as well, just reflect back when learners um, in, in our system, when they toy toy, when they get upset and they demonstrate and they, they get very angry about their learning processes, whether it's a learnership or apprenticeship or an internship, it's almost always about their stipend. I have never, in my experience, heard of learners actually toy-toying uh, or, or demonstrating about the curriculum or you know, the quality of training. Uh, there may have been incidences that I'm not aware of, but it's very, very far from between. It's almost as if uh, you know, what they actually learn 
uh, is not that important. It's about first and foremost of that. And that really is a huge difficulty, I think. So um, it's all about earning and not so much about learning. Okay, so those are the first three steps. Um, from step four uh, and then step five, step six, you will recognize as the rollout. Uh, learners are enrolled or contracted or registered, whatever you want to call it. There, that step of four uh, colleagues, very critical, the workplace-based learning program agreement regulations. We've had a workshop on that in the past. Or all ASDA members really need to understand those regulations very, very carefully, understand them. There are lots of opportunities in those regulations. I have recently uh, had the opportunity to actually apply the regulations as part of a proposal to uh, one of the CETAs, and I've built into uh, our proposal, uh, we've actually built in uh, funding for candidates, uh, candidacies for actually skills development technicians. And I'm hoping that we get funding for that so that I can take uh, a group of young people and over a period of two years, uh, develop them to become designated skills development technicians. Uh, and there's actually funding from that for the CETA under that candidacy uh, section of the programs. Very important for us to understand. And then the assessment and certification, uh, that's the whole assessment system, uh, the trade centers, the assessment centers, and of course, the recognition of prior learning. And then <clears throat> employment and self-employment right at the end, uh, we had a huge debate uh, around whether that should be included in these seven steps or not. But ultimately, the working group that works with us, which includes quite a few employers as well as international colleagues from ILO and GIZ, they all said, no, no, you cannot exclude uh, that step. So that, that is the, the approach. Uh, colleagues, I know that some of you may have already seen this before. Uh, it has been floating around. Uh, there's quite a lot of work going on about this. We've had two webinars from QCTO on this as well. So some of this may not be news to you, but I think it's something that we need to really grow and understand and almost on a daily basis uh, get try to get better and better and better. Now, Marina, if you, if you click once, you should get, uh, yeah, you see there. So colleagues, these are the feedback loops. When you assess uh, a candidate and the assessment, points out uh, on a regular basis that he or she is not competent against certain competencies, then those competencies may not be in the qualification and programs. In, in the design of the curriculum, the design of the rollout, something is just falling short there somewhere. That, that, is, the, uh, that is why we have that feedback. If we go to the next one, please, Marina. Uh, again here, uh, career guidance and, and management. If you don't link your advice that you give to young people about what, what they should study against actual registered programs and qualifications, uh, then they are also in the dark. A very important uh, feedback loop there. The next one, please, Marina. Colleagues, this is the actual rollout. So during the rollout, where knowledge and application is delivered on site, uh, when you roll out a qualification, uh, if something goes wrong there, you, you are starting to learn something. And then you discover that, hang on a minute, there's something missing here in this program. You must also uh, give feedback. While I'm on that one, I hope you colleagues have noticed the expression that we've used there, knowledge and application, which is different to the current design of occupational qualifications, because they are currently designed to have knowledge modules, practical modules, and then work experience modules. But the thinking around the future for occupational qualifications is that you would have knowledge, which may also include some practical work to make sure that you actually understand the applied knowledge. And then you have application. And application is often either in a workplace or in fact in a simulated environment. Uh, the new skills programs, which in some cases that have been developed by the QCTO. Uh, I think that, that this is an area which is where the QCTO is going much too slow. We need a lot more action there. Some of those skills programs have already got these, this design in them where you have knowledge modules and application modules, only two types of modules. And then the learner is rotated between the application and the knowledge. So basically in simple English, it's the theory and 
practice. So I sort of did, so that's the roller. Colleagues, that section, that step five, of course, is where uh, a huge, probably the, it's probably the, the, the the step in this uh, seven steps that I would put a big red ring around is the most important thing because that's where your lecturers, your trainers are, uh, and your workplace mentors come in to involve. And, and this is really, really important. If we don't get really good quality lecturers, trainers, and workplace mentors involved in step five, then, uh, like they would say in Afrikaans, I'm funny, pop or be cool, it, it just would not work. So step five is the actual rollout. And of course, step five can be a week. It can be four years and anything in between. So it is, it is not time bound. It depends entirely on the qualification and the rollout. And then the next, um, the next one, please, Marina. And this, I think, is the most, uh, also very really important. There we go. Thanks, Marina. So colleagues, and this is the one that I referred to previously where we link step one and step seven. Uh, very, very important to make sure that uh, what people are learning, uh, they can actually use when they come out the pipeline at the end. Now, <clears throat> colleagues, the question, of course, that many of you may be asking is, OK, this is all really cool. It looks great. It's a nice little graphic. Uh, uh, lots of nice um, ideas here and so on. But where do I fit in? What can I do? And so on. So, Marina, I think uh, if you just go to the next uh, one more down, uh, please. Oh, sorry. My apologies. I forgot about the RPL. Oops, sorry. Going back one step. Colleagues, recognition of prior learning was also a hot debate. And many people said that it, it was uh, applicable to many, many places. And so we try to depict it in this manner, in that in step three, four, five, and six, RPL applies one way or another in all three of those steps. In step three, it's about explaining what RPL is when you give career guidance. Step four is, of course, when you enroll or contract a learner, you consider his previous work and experience. And so when he is contracted, he might be contracted in something that requires very little training, just a bit of gap training. Of course, during the actual rollout, during the actual knowledge and application, there could be some time saved because if the person has learned some other thing uh, in, in the engineering environment, the person may have already done some occupational health and safety training. And so you can tick it off as part of the rollout. And then, of course, during assessment and certification, there are some people, of course, that go straight to step six, they, they completely miss uh, step four and five because they have so much experience and knowledge over the years, they go straight for step six, which is assessment uh, as an RPL candidate. And so uh, RPL applies in, in all of those areas. Uh, thank you, Marina. And the next uh, point, okay. So colleagues, these um, seven steps are clearly demarcated into three very, very specific sections. Absolutely obvious when you start thinking about it. And that's what I just want to talk about now and what these each of these three demarcated areas are and possibly where ASDA's members, uh, what they can do, what they can, can participate in. Uh, just up front, I want to indicate that this is, this is my view, it's a subjective view, and I may have missed things. So it is something that we can build on uh, and develop and say so these are the sort of services that ASDSA members can offer their clients uh, that they can do for themselves and develop. So, Marina, if you hit the down arrow once more, if you're just there. So, first of all, colleagues, steps one, two, and three is all about planning. Uh, you must under understand if you look at steps one, two, and three, there's act no actual learning has happened. People are thinking about learning, thinking about the qualification getting the workplaces and the training providers ready to deliver. But no actual delivery is happening. There's no real learners involved yet in step one, two, and three. Learners are getting advice and so on, but they haven't really signed up yet. And so here we have various roles that we as ASDS members can play. Of course, if you are a subject matter expert, 
you can certainly be part of a development quality partner. It's an organization that develops the qualifications and programs, or you can be a member of the assessment quality partner that develops the assessments, the moderations, and the various tests and so on. Um, I know many of our SDS members in the engineering world, for example, they work with the National Autism Moderation Body, NAM, because they are subject matter experts in engineering, like carpentry and weather making and so on. And uh, they, they, they have the roles. Many of those roles are voluntary roles, uh, but sometimes you can get paid to do some of that work. Of course, there's the learning materials development. Uh, colleagues, this is still a, a very, very big need. Um, some of you may, are, may be aware that the Department of Higher Education and Training, through their uh, career guidance uh, unit, which is a very big unit, uh, have developed a thing called a, a National Open Learning System, a NOLS, N-O-L-S. There's a new acronym for us all to remember, an N-O-L-S. And on that uh, NOLS is now already learning material for uh, 12 artisanal trades that are currently are being, is being sort of piloted, tested by some of the public civic colleges. Uh, lecturers, trainers, mentors, learners um, get that access to that system. And uh, there is a, a, a discussion going on uh, on when that system will be open to everybody. So the idea is that eventually anybody that wants to uh, deliver a particular program will have access to this uh, uh, national open learning system. So learning materials will be available to all people. So that we can have a minimum standard. Of course, a lot of private providers would take that learning material and they would add to it. They would add their additional um, <clears throat> value to such a thing. But it is coming. Uh, in many other countries, uh, learning materials are absolutely open. They're, they're available uh, and people just add to them and so on. So that is coming. I'm not too sure when, but uh, we hope soon. And of course, then there's the accreditation and workplace approval processes that some of the ASDA members may already be involved in that. The QCTO does use consultants, subject matter experts to go around. They can get paid for that. Uh, we believe this is a system that needs to get more standardized. Uh, and we really can't live with this when, when we have 21 different uh, accreditation and uh, workplace approval systems, one per CETA. Uh, it, is, it is moving towards standardization, uh, but many of us could work in that environment. And then, of course, lifelong career development. Uh, many of us can work there, advise people on a thing. And then the big one is the workplace skills plans and annual training reports uh, linked to financial incentives and the triple BEE, and, of course, the proposals for uh, discretionary grants. Now, colleagues, the... This is all work that fits into steps one, two, and three. So when you look at those steps one, two, and three, you just ask yourself, where's my expertise? Where, 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 what can I do? Uh, I recently had to do a proposal for a discretionary grant, and I spent quite a lot of time around step one, looking at qualifications and programs that are available, aligning it to what I want the specific young people that I want to fund in that description, you what I want them to learn so that at the end of the three years, what are the competences that they have and how they can add value to the system. So this is, this is where we really add value. Uh, Marina indicated there are so many people in ASDSA that have years of experience. If I'm not mistaken, we have um, almost close to 100 designated members, and those are all people that can really add value in this planning environment. So, Maria, the next section, please. Let me click once. There we go. So, colleagues, uh, steps four, five, and six, clearly it's implementation. Uh, this is where the rubber hits the road. Uh, you have to get going. And uh, here are some of the roles that I believe we can play. Uh, oh. Critical, yes. Doc, sorry. We do have a hand up, um, Andy. You just would like to ask you a question. Can 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 I do that? You know, because it's Andy, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Doc. It is yeah. a question. Yeah. 
Go ahead. Yeah, Andy, Andy, Andy is the financial, he, he looks after the money in ASDSA. And guys, you never say no to the bank manager. <laughs> <laughs> like that. Andy, Andy, go ahead. Go ahead. First, the thing that's missing from this linked model for me is the, there's no specific reference to uh, workplace experience. So there's knowledge and application in number five. But the workplace experience is such a critical part of getting people to be competent. And it's not mentioned here. And it, it worries me. Why is that? Um, it, uh, Andy, the, the word application is, includes that workplace experience. That's absolutely, uh, maybe it's not explicit enough. But when we talk about application, we, we had a lot of debates as to what we call step five. And uh, because you are looking at practical, simulated, and workplaces, and so on, eventually the word application was determined as the most suitable word. But behind application is all about workplace experience. I'll, I'll tell you why this concern arises for me, is that <clears throat> it's very easy to underplay the vital importance of the workplace experience. And I keep seeing it happen often driven by providers, whether they're private or public, whose focus is what happens in the learning environment. Yeah. So they focus on those things. Um, and they don't focus on what's actually very difficult to do, is, to, is just to make sure that people get good job experience and become really good on the job. That's, so that's my concern. Yeah, and it's very well put. Um, and that's why I think when the whole step five is... Uh, is rolled out and so on, the, the rules and regulations and so on around step five must drive this importance of workplace experience. I know that many of the qualifications will have a certain percentage of time, minimum time that you have to be work experience, like 70%, 30% knowledge. I also am very aware, and I had experience of this in the public uh, uh, TVET college sector, where because of the historic nature of our public TVET colleges, which were basically schools, you know, classroom based, uh, there was a huge amount of pressure to increase the amount of time in the classroom and less time at the workplace, because that's the culture to a large degree uh, in many of the public spaces. So you're right there. But we just have to keep plugging away at that to make sure that they are absolutely spent the maximum amount of time reasonably allowable in, in a workspace. Of course, there are some occupations, strangely enough, where you actually need more time in the knowledge space and less in the applied space. A, research, a researcher, for example, may be one of those individuals who uh, is much more theoretically inclined rather than workplace inclined, maybe. You know. So one does have to play. But to come back to your question, that word application is where the work experience is. Good. Can I move on? Yeah, please go ahead. Thank you. Okay, so colleagues, I was just talking about the implementation. Um, I just want to really stress this lead employer, host employer arrangement that we currently have in, in South Africa and how important uh, this is uh, for our system, particularly related to small and medium businesses. Uh, this is the only way that your small businesses will become involved in skill development. Uh, we, I think we still need to improve our lead employer, host employer arrangements. I don't think they are efficient enough and we need to get better at them. Uh, I really like the, uh, the, uh, Australia, uh, train, the Australian model of the GTO, the uh, it's called General Training Organization. They have one that is per, per state, per, per uh, area in, in, in Australia that is funded by the government. And that organization's uh, Pure and simple, their role is to manage learners around various workplaces and so on. And they particularly really work very closely with SMMEs. And so uh, I think there's still a lot of work to be done in what we call the intermediary space. That is the sort of global expression that is used. In Germany, they have a, a similar thing. They, they, they call them um, uh, training centers or uh, ICTs, intercompany training centers. And an interesting thing in the German system, those intercompany training centers, they pick up and fill gaps uh, where a learner is at a particular workplace and they don't cover all of the curriculum at a particular workplace. And that can happen often 
uh, in a small business or maybe even in a big business. And so there might be little bits and pieces of a curriculum that the learner misses. And so the intercompany training center fills up that gap uh, by doing it at the training center. That's the German system that, that works so well as well. So I think going forward, that is something that's very important. Uh, the next one that our ASDA members are getting more and more involved in on a daily basis, and I think this is really good news because we have got some really good creative members, and this is the online learning development process, whether it's materials, whether it's assessments, whether it's just learner management systems, uh, and so on, which is the next one, NMS development maintenance. All of this virtual space uh, is starting to grow very nicely. I recently had the pleasure of watching a video where there was a group of plumbers going through a virtual reality trade test. It was a, a nice little exercise done by the Institute of Plumbing together with some German colleagues. And they had uh, these plumbers were sitting at the desks and they had screens in front of them and uh, various plumbing tasks were popped up on the screen and the apprentice had to look at the task and then move things around. They had to uh, actually build a, a system on the computer, explain you know, what the different parts were, and they were doing all of this in a virtual reality type environment. And I think that could be a really interesting way of going forward. There's a lot of this work happening all over the world, and I think it's a space that we as members can definitely grow into. Uh, I just mentioned some of the individual roles uh, that are important here. RPL advisor, uh, very critical. There's some really good RPL advising courses that are going around. Uh, we are working with the International Labour Organization and rolling out a massive online, open online course soon, a MOOC on RPL. It will probably start rolling out from uh, end January next year and completely free. And it's a seven week course, uh, first three weeks, what we call the RPL Essentials. And then the uh, last four weeks is for more advanced RPL practitioners. So those of you who really want to learn more about RPL, uh, have a watch out for that. We will tip you off when it happens. I'm directly involved in that at the moment. Um, and colleagues, can I just mention that um, if any of you uh, have an interest in, in RPL and understanding RPL better, um, there are, Three countries in the world which have impressed me enormously. Uh, one is Germany. I was so surprised to, to, to find out that Germany has such a sophisticated and efficient and effective RPL system. Because one would think that in Germany, you know, why do you need RPL? You know, all the young people, they grow up, well-trained, developed, and so on. Until you discover that uh, in, in Germany, you have huge numbers of migrants that come into Germany from particularly Eastern Europe, as well as the Middle East. And so many of those migrants have got fantastic skills. And so I recently watched a video on the German system of a young chap from Syria, uh, a young Arab gentleman. And this guy was an excellent uh, auto electrician. He really, really was well-trained as an auto electrician. But he's in Germany, he can't speak German, and he really struggles to make people understand. And so he went through the RPL system and he got a job at, at a, quite a large German uh, motor car manufacturer as an auto electrician. And the German chaps are absolutely enthralled with the man's skills and so on. So it just shows you how uh, this is happening. The other amazing country with the recognition of prior learning is India. Uh, India, those of you who may not know, uh, is 95% of the Indian economy is informal. And it's those informal people that go through RPL. And they've taken RPL right down to a task level, literally uh, you know, making tea, baking bread. They're RPL people for that. Any, any kind of task, just literally fixing uh, a phone, replacing batteries in, in electrical things. They, they RPL people at those levels. And those people get certificates and they get jobs in the formal sector at such a task level. They have done 5 million people in the last four years. Interesting thing in India, if you pass your RPL, you get 500 rupees per person, and you get a free one-year accident insurance. That was that for incentivizing RPL. Excellent stuff. 
Uh, we are trying to improve our RPL system in South Africa, but we have a long way to go. Colleagues, of course, facilitator, trainer, lecturer, coach, mentor, these are critical roles. And if any of us have the opportunity to, to uh, be involved in those roles, uh, please continue to upgrade your skills. Uh, remember, being a trainer or even a lecturer or coach or a mentor in an online environment is quite different to standing in a classroom uh, and so on. And so we need to upgrade our skills. There are some nice new occupational qualifications around. And those of you, many of you will know that we have launched a process already with QCTO for a part qualification called a workplace based learning and development practitioner. And uh, next week we will be sitting and seeing how we can get at least 24 individuals onto that pilot program. But I've heard some rumors. I had a discussion with my friend at QCTO on Monday, and uh, he is saying to me, you know, there's such a demand. There are large numbers of people that have applied for, for the uh, pilot program. And so there is a real, real discussion on the table now is how do we enlarge the pilot program? Not just 24 people. How do we do? How do we get more people involved? And there are quite a few seaters that have put up their hands and said they also want to support this. Now, colleagues, this is great because if we can get workplace uh, based learning and development practitioners uh, trained and developed, these, this is an army of individuals that are working and helping us find workplaces and linking workplaces with learners and so on. That is uh, you know, what that program is all about. So I'm very excited. And of course, our assessors and moderators, our colleagues, uh, we, those assessors, your, your assessor standard has uh, been around for a long time, the ASS OT is at, at assessor standard. But I think as the new assessments get rolled out uh, from QCTO, uh, we might have to just upgrade our skills a little bit. So what's that space? I think QCTO have got their own approach to it, the subject matter expert database type approach. Uh, if you haven't registered yet on that uh, subject matter expert database of QCTO, please go and do so, uh, so that you can get onto that database as a subject matter expert. And you might be able to pick up uh, a little bit of work in that environment if you are a subject matter expert. So colleagues, these are some of the roles that we can play here. Uh, and remember, this is all about uh, steps four, five, and six, and making it better and better and better. And then critical, the last one, please, Marina. Click on there. And the impact. And so this is employment and self employment. And colleagues, this is where uh, the impact uh, can be seriously uh, influenced by ASDA members through our research and, and advocacy. Uh, so if we have any sort of research capacities, there's quite a lot of impact work that continues to uh, be implemented. Uh, are people getting work uh, and so on? Uh, this capacity for impact analysis needs to grow in our country and as well as advocacy so that uh, if a particular program really works well, if there's a certain program where people are coming out and they're getting jobs like crazy, uh, we must pick up on that and say, hang on a minute, if you, this thing is really working. Why is it working? And let's talk about it and, and, and get it there. And of course, the coaching and mentoring is very big here. Uh, young people or even older people, when they have to upskill and reskill, uh, they go into environments they might be completely uh, new in, and that's very, uh, you know, that can be very um, stressful. And so they need someone to hold their hand, whether it's a coach or a mentor. And so coaching and mentoring is something that we need to develop. Uh, hopefully, colleagues, many uh, ASTSA members, especially those who are now again more and more experienced once you've got between five to ten years of experience of skills development uh, to become a coach and mentor is, is a natural progression uh, for a, a person that works in skills development we do it naturally anyway we're always helping people and so we might also start to formalize it become a formal official designated coach and the coach and mentoring of south africa is a professional body and uh, i can just indicate that i am working very closely with the uh, professional body of Comensa. And in fact, we are hoping soon to have a partnership with the German GIZ organization to start the development of occupationally based coach and mentor qualification. That will probably be skills programs. And so that we can start to uh, 
move ahead in that field as well. Many of you may know, but in the more developed countries like Germany and so on, you cannot be a mentor or a coach if you don't have a formal qualification in those fields. So that's how we get this quality up and so on. So colleagues, that's the holistic approach uh, that, that is being developed and so on. Um, I think as we go ahead, I think it is reasonably comprehensive. I've noted the comment from Andy about the word work-based experience or workplace-based experience that, that we use in South Africa. Uh, Andy, what I am quite happy to do, I can raise it at the next working group, uh, which will be next week, to say, you know, one of the members has raised this, so should we not include it somewhere so that it's not lost as a, as a word? Um, and so thank you uh, for that comment. Colleagues, I think I want to really stress something here. Uh, as we go forward, we must make sure that this system uh, really is a well-oiled system. Uh, we, we can't have uh, these various steps working on their own and not linked to the others. So they really need to work well, uh, like a really good well-oiled chain, uh, and so that the uh, comes out smoothly and employment is linked. So step one and step seven very closely linked. So that's my story. Uh, Maren, if you, you can uh, go to the next slide. Uh, I always just end off uh, uh, my little discussions with colleagues like yourselves with a quote from the uh, Benjamin Franklin to say that, um, tell me and I forget, teach me and I remember, but involve me and I learn. And so uh, I always equate that to the apprenticeship system. I wish in South Africa we only had apprenticeships like in many other countries. In Switzerland, when you're at 16, you have a choice of go to university or go to an apprenticeship. 70% of the youngsters in Switzerland go on an apprenticeship. Why? It's because there is an apprenticeship for everything, banking, wholesale, you name it. There is an apprenticeship for everything that you could possibly think of in Switzerland. And so it's a nice, simple system. And many, many people at the age of 16 then start actually going into apprenticeship. They start earning a wage and they are working learning on the job. And colleagues, uh, that's my personal passion and so on. And that's what I coach as I uh, synaptically mentor your brain waves uh, around my discussions. I hope I haven't missed anything, but I'm quite happy to uh, answer any questions now or later. Thank you very much, Marina, and the team for giving me the space. Eh? Thank you very much, Doc. Um, is there anybody that wants to ask a question? Uh, Marina, you see, when, when you've got no questions, it's one or two things, you see. Either uh, I was like, nobody understood me, or everybody is very hungry and they didn't go find something to eat. <laughs> so I'm hoping it's the second one. <laughs> um, I, think, I think it's very valuable, the information that we share, I, you know, things that you do, um, that you're involved with. Um, and I think we would like to have more interactions with you on the level that you are, if you're prepared to share that with information with us, um, then we can hear it beforehand. Um, yeah, Marina, absolutely. I, I will share um, as I can, of course. I engage continuously with uh, the, the network. I had a long discussion yesterday with the DDG skills uh, in, in the department. Uh, because I think many of us are very worried about the current uh, goings on in the department and all the um, <clears throat> activities. But I can just indicate that my, after my discussion with him yesterday, I actually felt, felt good. Um, there, I think there are still some very, very strong people in the department and uh, the, the strength of the department will remain there. We've had some new appointments. Uh, Mr. Zungu, uh, who's now head of TVET, He's a great guy that he ran one of the best colleges in the country, Umfalozi College out of Bridges Bay, uh, set up the only maritime training institute that I'm aware of in the country. And he's a great guy. And we've now got a new DDG, uh, a lady called uh, Demisa Fuchana. She's the DDG in charge of the community colleges. And uh, she's been in the system many years. I used to work with her as well. And so hopefully we will get some more go ahead there. Uh, we're looking forward to the new DG. The, the, the new DG um, is uh, in the process of shortlisting, I think, for the new director general for the department. 
but the current acting DG, uh, Dr. Phil Jarwa from Science and Technology, I've worked with him for many years when I was at the Human Resource Development Council. He's a great guy, and uh, I don't know if he'll stay there, but if he does, I think we, we're in good hands. So I just wanted to assure our members that even though there's quite a lot of negativity going around in the media at the moment, I think there is still quite a lot of solid strength in the party. And they will help us uh, go forward. There's no doubt. Uh, I think one of the things that we do need to do quite soon, Lorena, as a group, is to, is to maybe ask uh, the DBG for skills, Mr. Mbalo, to actually talk to the group to ASDSA on the new skill strategy for the uh, National Economic and Recruitment uh, Plan. Um, that strategy came out in February this year as a draft. But the department has done a huge amount of consultative work across industry. And this concept of what is called a master plan, a master plan for a particular sector, which includes skills, seems to be growing, you see. And we as ASDSA members in the sectors that we work in, uh, we need to become aware of this. So I think uh, I will talk to him and ask him how does he feel about it. He, he's very open to doing those sort of discussions. He's about you know, making sure the system moves ahead. And so we'll see if we can get him to talk to us about that uh, skill strategy and when it will be released and so on. It is already out there. He's presenting it to various groups. I don't know if any ASDA members are members of the Human Resource Development Council at the moment. I don't know if we have a member there, but they apparently got the presentation yesterday. And so somebody could share it with us. Mm -hmm. So I right. think we do yeah. need to uh, keep, keep, we'll keep tabs at that systemic level and uh, where I can help, uh, I definitely will. I would appreciate that, yes. Um, maybe if we can get him to speak, um, maybe even if it's half an hour or hour session in 45 minutes or whatever. So if you are, Flores, yeah, if you can please do that for us, I'll appreciate that. Marina, we, I see uh, yeah. Michael, Michael Tiger. Uh, has asked a question there. Can I respond to that? Yes, you okay. can. So, Michael, you're asking the question, is skills development discussed at NEDLAC in any form? Uh, the answer is yes, uh, a, a big yes, in actual fact. There, um, first of all, just to indicate to you, NEDLAC appoints, nominates, and, and points the individuals that sit on the National Skills Authority. The National Skills Authority is the uber body, it's the statutory body that advises the minister on skills development. So, for example, the National Skills Development Strategies, one, two, and three, and now the National Skills Development Plan 2030, all of that is the work of the National Skills Authority. The employer representatives, the organized labor representatives, and the representatives of the community that serve on the National Skills Authority all come from NEDLAC. And so NEDLAC plays a critical role in skills development. And there are quite a few colleagues that I work with uh, who work also at NEDLAC. Today at 10 o'clock, I'm joining the National Artisan Moderation, uh, National Artisan Development Advisory Body, which is chaired by Mr. Amon Tatemi, and uh, he's from Organized Labor. And many of the colleagues that sit there are also from the NEDLAC. And NEDLAC has got a group of individuals that specifically look at skills all the time. So the answer is, in fact, yes, there, there's a big emphasis on NEDLAC. Uh, all skills development legislation has to go through NEDLAC for sign-off before it goes to Parliament. That is required by the NEDLAC Act. You see. So uh, if, you if you find a grant regulation out for public comment, if you find a skills development act out for public comment, I think you can rest assured that it's already been scrubbed by NEDLAC before it goes out for public comment. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, there was one other question from Kim. Can yeah. we maybe get more information on moles and how that works? Yeah, that one, um, I think we just have to wait for the department to um, decide when they will um, open up the system and when they will present it. Uh, at the moment, I, my understanding, Marina, is that the uh, public TVET college facilitators, stroke lecturers, trainers that are involved with the centers of specialization have got access to that system. That is my understanding. 
and they've got access to the learning materials on that system relevant to their particular um, uh, occupation. So, for example, Morena, in your case, I know that you work quite closely with the Athlone uh, campus on motor mechanics and the RMI and so on. And so there you might be able to get a discussion there with the facilitator at that college, at that campus to say, can you just show me the north? What does it look like? And then you can, that is maybe how the only way that you could possibly access it at the moment. So Kim, okay. if, if you can get a link through to a public Tibet college, one of those uh, 26 campuses that are doing the centers of specialization rollout, they might be able to then say, yeah, this is what it looks like. It, it's not public yet, uh, but uh, I do know the lady that is dealing with it directly. So I keep on asking her, one or one or one. You know? So one of these days we'll get it. Wonderful. Thank you very, very much. Yeah, I'll, what I'll do is I'm part of that pilot project with the occupational certificate. Um, I'll go and see. <laughs> yeah, go do a bit of research for us. <laughs> yeah, I'll do that. Is there any other more questions? I've scrolled through. Um, I think I did answer what does LEED stand for right towards the beginning. Yeah, yeah there we go. Professional body. I got the comment on, on Andy from work experience. I think we are covered. I think so. Yeah. Doc, thank you very, very much for that information. Um, Absolutely. Really, it's, it's, yeah, it's appreciated that, that you keep us up to date and that you're part oh. of the family, as they say. Absolutely. Will you excuse me? I, I do need to yes. jump off and, and go now and start to prepare myself for my colleagues at the National Audit and Development Advisory Body. 100%. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. Take care, everybody. All right. Bye. Bye. Right. Jump off. Sorry, Marina. Before you guys mm -hmm. jump off, just check in the chat box. There is a link for CPD points for this meeting. Thank you very much, Angelique. Yes. So if everybody can just go to the chat box and then just get the link there for the CPD point. Ben, just thank you for your presence. Please stay safe. I see it's raining here in Cape Town, pouring rain. So just my last thought here. Don't focus on your weakness, shortcomings, obstacles, failures, losses, setbacks, and what you can't control. Focus on your strengths, talents, opportunities, successes, gains, growth, and what you can control. So thank you everybody for attending this session. If there's any other questions, you can just email them or put them on, you know, on the Dropbox, uh, on the Dropbox, on the WhatsApp group. Um, for those that are not members, you can maybe email to info at asdsa.org.za. Um, yeah, stay safe and enjoy the rest of the week. Thank you.